Yeah. But, but, but here's the rub, too. It can't be hard-coded exactly. So look, here's, here's something interesting about Christianity. It was actually posed as an interesting question in, in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar near the end. Um, the, 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 the actor who played Judas asks Christ after he's dead, there, there's sort of a, there's a scene where everyone's singing and dancing. It's a strange sort of quasi-disco scene. And Judas asks why Christ had to come to earth at such a strange time and in such an isolated place. Because he appears as a carpenter in a backwoods region, you know, 2,000 years ago. Why then? Why there? And the answer is, the, the divine principle has to manifest itself constantly within the confines of an individual life with all of the peculiarities and idiosyncrasies and limitations of that individual life. And so part of the reason that the ideal beckons is because you can't just be born as Christ because what Christ represents, let's say this overarching ideal, is actually the union of the divine with the particulars of your time and place. And so because you're particularized, then you have to determine how to manifest the archetype in your conditions, in your specific conditions. That, and that's partly associated with that dialogue with your conscience. So there's an archetypal mode of being that's, that's supposedly the ideal, and you have to integrate it with your surroundings. That's and what needs to happen every right. time. It has to be met. That's right. It has to be manifest in the particulars of your time and place. Yeah. And that's the individuation process. Yeah. That's exactly what it is, because you regard the self, like you regarded Christ as a symbol of the self. He actually reversed the, the, the spiritual and the psychological. Yeah. Right, or the theological and the psychological. He, and he thought he was thinking about the cosmic Christ. As a, and for Jung, the self was the totality of individual being. It was yeah. everything that you were right now, everything that you were in the past, but also everything that you could possibly become across your, your set of potential yeah. futures. There's, there's one paragraph from Jung that I'm going to send to you in the chat right now. And I would like to ask you if you could, could read it out. It's not that long, because I think that illustrates exactly what, what you're talking about. I'm sending you a link. Oh. If you click on it, it's an image. And when, you probably know it. When a summit is reached, when the bud unfolds, and from the lesser, the greater emerges, then, as Nietzsche says, one becomes two. And the greater figure, which one always was, but which remained invisible, appears to the lesser personality with the force of a revelation. Yes, and that's the manifestation of the self. That's right. What that is is an intimation of who you could be. Yeah. And it's, it's also an intimation of what you're associated with that might guide you to what you could be. So, so it would, you might say it's a revelation of your own possibility, but it's your rev a revelation of your possibility in relationship to something that's infinite and transcendent. Yeah, yeah. that's the, that's the, and, and I would also say that that does, that is also very commonly manifested by a transformation in the relationship with conscience. Because when something like this happens, sometimes this happens to people, for example, in um, hallucinatory or psychedelic experiences, right? They start to take their conscience seriously. As the see, Jung believed at least to some degree that what guided your interest, and that would include your conscience, was a manifestation of the totality of the self in the restricted domain of the present. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's okay. So, so okay, which one always was, but which remained invisible, right? That's the heavenly father. That would be the the Marcus Aurelius principle that manifests itself in, in, in Maximus and that, yeah. that, that, that Comitus resists, mm -hmm. right? And, and which Marcus Aurelius also made himself subordinate to, at least to some degree, right? That's the, the one which always was, but which remained invisible. Yeah. 
he who is truly and hopelessly little will always drag the revelation of the greater down to the level of his littleness and will never understand that the day of judgment for his littleness has dawned. But the man who is inwardly great will know that the long-expected friend of his soul, the immortal one, has now really come to lead captivity captive, that is, to seize hold of him by whom this immortal had always been confined and held prisoner, and to make his life flow into that greater life, a moment of deadliest peril. Nietzsche's prophetic vision of the tightrope walker reveals the awful danger that lies in having a tightrope walking attitude towards an event to which St. Paul gave the most exalted name he could find. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, quite, the, that's quite the densely packed paragraph, yeah. that one. Uh, for, yeah, for, for a few years ago, it's from, it's from uh, the Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, right. Right. page 121. If, uh, right. and that's volume one, right? Because volume two is Ion, which is even a more frightening book. So yes, because the, the peril that Jung talks about there is the peril of psychosis, at least in part, inflation. Because well, the, the manifestation of that, that second figure, let's say, the self, it's, it's, it's a deadly temptation as well, because once you see that there's a relationship between you and the transcendent, let's say, and you start to take that seriously, then you can, you can, you can become inflated by that yeah. sense of prophetic duty, let's say, and, 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 that's, and that's a very dangerous temptation. Yeah, that he actually writes this like 20 pages further. He says, for the great psychic danger, which always is, is always connected with individuation, lies in the identification of ego consciousness with the self. This produces yes. inflation which, threaten, which threatens conscience, consciousness yes. with dissolution. Yes, and he wrote a great essay, a great essay called Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, which is completely uncom incomprehensible unless you know the background that we're discussing, where he warned very carefully that you have to stay in the proper relationship to the self, right? If the self overtakes the 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 ego, then mm -hmm. that's a descent into like manic religious insanity. Yeah. It's something that balance has to be struck where there's a relationship with the transcendent, but there's also still the grounding in the particulars of here and now. You see this echo, this idea echoed, interestingly enough, in the superhero mythology that, that dominated the adolescent imagination in the 20th century. Every superhero, so you imagine a superhero is like, a partial manifestation of the redemptive archetype. Mm -hmm. Every superhero has to have an alter ego. And the alter ego, well, for Superman, it's Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter. And for Spider-Man, it's, you know, high school, troubled high school quasi-nerd. And but, but what's so interesting about those stories is that they understand that without the alter ego, there's no superhero that both of those have to exist at the same time, the limitations mm -hmm. and, the, and the transcendence of the limitations have to both be there, that, that terrible paradoxical juxtaposition. Yeah. And yeah. so because the, 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 character isn't, the character can't exist without that tension. And, yeah. and, I, and I think that that's, well, that motif wouldn't recur continually unless there was something to it that was narratively precise and yeah. accurate. There's something in, the, in this paragraph that I want to tie together with our uh, previous talk because Jung talks about the end stage of individuation as, as a coming together with the immortal. He calls it the immortal. Yeah. Now Joseph Campbell, Campbell does exactly the same. He says the Christ in you doesn't die, the Christ in you survives death and resurrects. And you said in our last talk when you um, closed your um, you, elabor you elaborated on the death of Socrates and how he died in truth and honor. And then you said, that part of the spirit doesn't die. So there is this theme of these people are somehow connected with something that is immortal and, and eternal. Could that be understood simply as they have, they have established a relation with an archetypal mode of being that is eternal? and that continues to exist uh, beyond them and before them, but they've, they've established a relationship with that. Is, is that what, the, what he means by 
by the immortal. Well, that, yes, that, that is, that's what's meant, is that that's mm -hmm. right. It's, that, it's the eternal pattern. It's the eternal yeah, music. Exactly. It's like you're yeah. dancing to the eternal music. And the music goes on even if you depart the scene. Yeah, exactly. Now, now the Christian, there's a Christian insistence, though, that, that I also wouldn't overlook, which is that that also characterizes the finite, right? That's the promise of the resurrection, that the resurrection of the body, is that the Christians insist that that transcendent factor exists, and, and that's the Christ, that's the word that's there at the beginning of time and at the end of time as, as the judge in Revelation. Right, this transcendent logos that's, yeah. that's eternal, but that that's no more valuable in some sense than the particular, the yeah. particularized creature that's 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 subject to apparent, apparent permanent death, and yeah. you know it's very difficult for modern people to grant the idea of the bodily resurrection any credence, and I. It's not something of which anyone can speak, I believe, with any degree of, what would you say, non-arrogant authority, something like that. But by the same token, the world is a very strange place, and it isn't obvious to me that I've learned to, I've learned to be very cautious in casually dismissing deep and ancient ideas regardless of their strangeness. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, see, the thing that's so interesting about that Christian insistence is that it valorizes the particular. That's unbelievably important because you could say, well, if it's merely a matter of the eternal, then the particular doesn't matter. But then if the particular doesn't matter, you end up with that kind of nihilistic Buddhism the suffering that characterizes, or even in, in the proclivity for Christianity to degenerate into the forms that Nietzsche criticized, which is, well, when you chase everything out into an eternal beyond, it justifies everything terrible that's happening on earth as trivial and insignificant and relieves you of your moral responsibility for, for addressing it. You can't, at the very minimum, the idea that the body is resurrected is a valorization of the value of the particular here and now and of the body, and, and an emphasis on the fact that that has divine value as well and needs to be attended to and cared for properly. At minimum, it's that. Yeah. That's profound. There's one, uh, one thing uh, on the Jung paragraph I want to reflect on. It's uh, when he says that individuation is a, could be a moment of deadliest peril. And then he refers to the, to the tightrope walker from Zarathustra. Uh, what I think this means is that it can be so, the, the danger can be so grave when you embark on individuation because it, it almost by definition means that, a, that the lesser you, the lesser part of your soul, the lesser soul has to die. Yeah. And that, and I think I've been there in, in my own life and that re requires violence and recovery is by no means guaranteed. Right, that's exactly, well that's why, that's why that motif that's the motif of going into the abyss to, re to, to rescue your father. Like, it's an abyss. It, 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 there's no guarantee yeah. that you'll emerge from it. No. Like, it, 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 it's a real, it's genuine peril. Now, the, you know, the, 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 what you need to be armed with in some sense to face that is the willingness to die, the faith yeah. in rebirth, the, the the what the the willingness as well or, or the the decision to start to abide by the truth yeah because in a moment of great peril this is another thing that, that, that this is one of the things i think that terrified me into um attempting to abide by the truth to the degree that i've been able to manage that see i i started to understand not least by reading jung that there would come points in my life where I needed to rely on my own judgment that I would be in a particular situation that no one could advise me about because no one would have access to the information about the particularities of my situation that I would have and that I could call on my relationship with the eternal, let's say, to some degree. But mm -hmm. if I had warped and corrupted my own judgment 
then <coughs> when when the necessity for a decision emerged, I would make the wrong decision. Yeah. And then I'd be lost. What, what stood out to me, the few times you talked about this, you, so, uh, in a few lectures, like as a sidetrack, you talked about the death of the soul. And what, what stood out to me is that you did this in a very, very visceral way. You really felt, it seemed to me like you felt the gravity of it. it um, and then when you uh, kind of la laid out your own story that you had to stop drinking, had to stop smoking to, to, um, to focus more on your work, uh, intuitively there was, to, there was a kind of a disparity between how visceral you could talk about the death of the soul and what you described as what that meant for you, which I interpreted as mainly changing your, your lifestyle a little and, uh, and, and focus on your studies. So the question would be that, why, why, why do you think I, I saw that disparity? And, and if the disparity is indeed there, how is it that you can talk about the death of the soul with such vigor? Well, I think, I, I do think that there are things that are worse than death. I, mean, I think that psychological disintegration might be worse than death because it can go on for so long and, and it can be so incredibly painful. Yeah. I do think that your point about communist, communist is correct, is that the state that he exists in is worse than death. It's hell. Yeah. And now, the disparity, I'm not sure exactly what you meant by that. Like, um, yeah. Um, what, what I meant was is that you talk with such vigor and in such a visceral way about the death of the soul, and then when you talked about letting parts of yourself die, you said it was mainly... It was stop drinking, stopping and stop smoking. Well, it, was so you could it was irresponsibility, I would say, at least to some degree. It, it, was, mm -hmm. it was the letting go of that because I had to make a choice between something approximating gratifying immediate pleasure seeking and hyper social, a hyper social way of being, you know, that wasn't sustainable in, in many ways for obvious reasons, and doing. <coughs> doing the difficult intellectual work yeah. that I had decided to embark on. And that was a, that was a death of a previous personality. And mm -hmm. It is trivial in some sense because it's, it's, it's burning off that which obviously needs to be burned off. But I would also say by the same token that that doesn't make it a straightforward process. It's, and you yeah. alluded to this, you know, you said that you underwent a similar set of experiences where the old parts of you had to die. It's like, well, that's suboptimal and immature as they are. First of all, those are still parts that are alive and still, and still an element of your being. They might even be parts that you love and that other people love. Yeah. And, and there's certainly things that you're familiar with. They're, they're modes of being that you're familiar with. It's, it's a major sacrifice to let yeah. elements of your personality go. It's, it's also By the way, a proper sacrifice. It was not an indictment on your part. No, it was I, just I one of no, no, I understand that. Good, good. See, the problem with the identity politics types, as far as I'm concerned, is that their proclivity is always to sacrifice someone else, the oppressor. And it, it's always externalized, the oppressor. But in the individuation process, you're the oppressor. You are the oppressor. Mm -hmm. And it's much, see, and this is also the problem. This is something I really came to understand when I was writing the foreword for the new version of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. I was like, what's the problem here? Well, something has to be sacrificed to put the world right. Well, who, what, who or what is going to be sacrificed? Well, you better make the proper sacrifices or you won't establish the right relationship with the transcendent. Well, let's identify the evil as something external to us and sacrifice that. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it meant in the Russian Revolution was that everyone died. But more, more specifically, everyone was killed. They were made into a burnt offering to God. And it was inappropriate. It's like, well, if you're going to sacrifice because you have to, you sacrifice yourself. Right? That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the crucifixion metaphor and what you sacrifice is you allow those parts of you that are unworthy to die 
You encourage them to die even. And, and, but we don't want to be foolish and say that that's merely a matter of pursuing your bliss, let's say, in, in, the, in the Joseph Campbell manner, or in the, maybe in the satirical. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, that's being a bit hard on Campbell, but it was an unfortunate phrase. Yeah. Because it, it, it and, and he knew better, because he knew about the journey into the abyss. Yeah. The, the sacrifice is, even if it's partial, it's still a death. I think also that this is why the, the death and rebirth, rebirth theme resonates so, so immediately in, in, in popular culture yeah. and in literature. For example, G Gandalf, who, who fell into the underworld, yeah. he, he, he fought the bell rock and then he emerged as, as Gandalf the White. Right, and everyone's everyone's soul. Well, and that's a, that's a that's a re representation of the transfiguration of Moses and Christ, Gandalf the White. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not like Tolkien didn't know these things. Yeah, I mean, he he knew these things perfectly well. That's right, and it's such a relief. I remember when I was a kid reading the Lord of the Rings for the first time. I was so appalled when Gandalf disappeared, and so relieved when he made when he, <laughs> when he appeared. It's like, oh no, Gandalf's gone. Like. It's the death of God, right? What What are we going to do yeah. now that the great wizard has has disappeared? Yeah, yeah, and and it is a, a terrible trial, and you see that with Gandalf's experiences in Underworld, and and yeah. he comes out white. Well, it's funny; he comes out white. White's interesting because white is the sun, and white is purity, but white is also age, you know. And and to undergo those experiences is also to risk. Well, the physiological, the psychophysiological stress that, that whitens your beard and that, that grays your hair. I'm going to tweet out now. Jordan Peterson says white is purity. <laughs> yeah. No You're kidding. toast, man. <laughs> now, but the thing is, you also see this in more shallow uh, popular culture. Have you ever heard of Dragon Ball Z? No. It's, it's kind of, a, it, it was a cartoon. It's an in, in anime. And the... Uh, you have these creatures, they're called Saiyans, and whenever they're, they're, they're warriors, and whenever they're in a fight with some eternal enemy, and the moment they're about to die, they can't, their, their spirit and their body can't take any more, they become super Saiyans, which is they resurrect and they transcend, and their hair stands up and it turns, turns, uh, turns yellow and they get electricity all around them, so whenever they are about to die, that's when they transcend. So they have been completely destroyed, and that's when their transcendence occurs. And that, in, in the beginning, they can't control it. And that's the theme that keeps the entire saga together, is this continual transcendence of the, of the, of the figure. It's one of the themes that I developed in Maps of Meaning is that there's ways of construing yourself, like you construe yourself as who you are. That's a stable state, let's say, who you are right now. That's me. And then that all falls apart. And then you construe yourself as the chaos that, that is, ensues when everything falls apart, and that's a state of hopelessness and nihilism. And then maybe you recover from that, and you establish a new sense of order. Yeah. You say, well, I passed through the underworld, and, and now I'm in a better place, and this is me, this better place. But then it's subject yeah. to fragmentation as well. And so what you learn is that you're not the order, no matter how compelling and secure and promising that order is. And you're not the chaos that ensues when that order is fragmented. And you're not even the reestablishment of new order. You're the process by which that transformation continually occurs. And that's the process of death and rebirth. And that's what you identify with, is that ever-renewing process of death and rebirth. And that's the identification with Christ that the Christians that the Christian narrative is aiming at, instilling, aiming yeah. at, to, to the degree that something like that aims. Yeah. So is this also the, the rope Nietzsche refers to, that man is a rope between beast and overman? I know that's not exactly the Christian de delineation, but it's still the... I think, still that's the more, I think that's probably more associated with the idea that we were talking about earlier. I mean, these ideas are all linked, but I think that's more associated with the idea that of the partnership between man and God mediated by conscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? yeah, it's, exactly. It's, yeah. yeah, man is that, is that intermediary figure. Yeah, exactly. We're an intermediary figure because we're, we're moving towards the idea, but we're clearly not that. 
Yeah. And th that is a tightrope place because moving towards the ideal is precarious, right? Because yeah. you're not the ideal and you can tumble at any moment. Yeah. And so there is a precariousness to our being psychically, psychologically and spiritually as well as physically. It's a, well, and that's, that's part of, of the eternal crucifixion as well is, is that, 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 that constant vulnerability of being. Yeah. It's part of the burden of being human. Yeah. But the necessary burden, I suppose, I mean, in my more, I, I don't know what would you call them. I don't know, you have these moments of thinking where you, they're more metaphysical. In my more metaphysical moments, I suppose, then I do see that God and man are engaged in a partnership to bring about the kingdom of God on earth, something like that, that there's something about that story that's exactly right, that we should be struggling uphill with our burdens towards the highest possible ideal, and that there's something about that that's true, or at least it's more true than anything else we can conceive of. Yeah. And so and that's the great adventure of life. That's what you want to be called to. And, and I think you are called to that by your conscience. Yeah. I think... We've, uh, we, we've talked for about 90 minutes now. I think this well, that's is a, good, a very good time to end. Yeah, yeah this is yeah. a great note to close off on.